Now, we don't have much time, so let's get right to it. I love comic books, and I've been reading them since I was in elementary school. For me, it all began with Spider-Man and Batman, but I've moved on to non-superhero stories as I've grown older. I believe comics to be the greatest form of the art of storytelling because of their merging of writing, artwork, and the need for the reader to still use their imagination. Plus, a creator can tell whatever story they want without worrying about not having the budget to achieve their vision. Over the past few years, certain controversial creative choices within the superhero genre have caused division between creators and the fan base. Having long been a fan of superhero comics himself and tired of seeing stories pushing political agendas, YouTube commentator Eric July chose to take a risk and create his own company promising to tell stories of heroism that are focused on entertainment rather than propaganda. That is the secret origin of Ripaverse Publishing and its flagship title, iSong. Since its release, iSong number one has been praised for upholding that promise of entertainment over agenda. But is this story really worthy of the hype? I chose to give it a read for myself to see if this book truly is a gem by a gifted newcomer, and then give you my views on the artwork, story, plot structure, and characters. I'm Jess Zilla, and this is my moronic opinion on iSong number one. I Psalm number one, titled Ill Advised Part One, was written by Eric July with pencils and inks by Cliff Richards and colors by Gabe El Taib. The story begins in the fictional Texas city of Flores Park. At the third police precinct, some cops talk about Alvacor not being utilized, which makes this mustached fella, their apparent chief, upset and he tells them to leave. Another cop comes into the room panicked and shows the chief something on her phone. He becomes alarmed by someone's return. Cut to Shadow Valley, on the outskirts of the city, to a ranch belonging to our hero, Avery Silman. Avery is an except, the term this world uses for their superhumans, and formerly the superhero known as Isaw. Avery receives a call from his sister, Altona, in regards to a family friend and co-worker, Jasmine, who has gone missing. Avery tells Altona that is a police matter. Altona says that Jasmine had been hanging around Avery's old friend, Darren Fontano, before her disappearance, so she would like Avery to speak to Darren about Jasmine's possible whereabouts. Altona convinces him to look into it by saying it should be done as a favor to Mrs. Newman, Jasmine's mother. Avery then reluctantly leaves his ranch for Flores Park to search for Jasmine. We cut back to Flores Park, where we are introduced to Yaira, an except and the person the cops were alarmed by earlier. Yaira is fighting the police and Alpha Corps, a team of police-sponsored excepts. Meanwhile, Avery arrives at Club Merc, the nightclub owned by Darren. Darren greets Avery, and the two go inside where Avery begins to question Darren about Jasmine. Darren derails the conversation by speaking of the differences between the two of them. He brags about the empire he has built through means that aren't necessarily legal, and makes an implication that he is also running a prostitution ring. He tells Avery not to worry about Jasmine, and orders his security to escort Avery out because his poking around has frustrated Darren. Avery fights a security guard and goes to confront Darren. A full brawl between Avery and Darren's security begins. After those fellows are defeated, Darren's elite security guard, the except known as Santuan, comes on the scene. Santuan makes quick work of Avery and yeets him half a mile across Flores Park, where he crashes into Yaira. Yaira fights Avery due to her mistaken belief that Avery is an undercover member of Alpha Corps who attacked her. She ends up taking Avery into the air, throws him back down to Earth, and flees the scene. Avery lands on top of a taxi and is knocked out. Cut to dusk back at Silman Ranch, where Sam, a ranch hand, speaks with a customer about the business and Avery's ambition. Sam then talks to another employee about how he likes his work ethic and says something to him akin to, One day, lad, all this will be yours. That night in Flores Park, we learn Alpha Corps delivered Avery to the hospital. A pair of medical professionals talk about the possibility of Avery being an except due to his surviving the fall. They enter his room and find him gone. We meet back with Avery, who is walking through an alleyway. He meets up with Altona, who has been tracking his location through a GPS anklet. Avery tells Altona that things didn't go too well when he spoke to Darren. Altona drives Avery to the impound because Avery believes Darren may have had his truck towed there after the fight at the club. Avery parts ways with Altona and tells her that he's going to pay Darren another visit. Meanwhile at the ranch, Sam sends the employee from the earlier scene home and receives a phone call from Avery. Avery says he'll be back home between sometime late that night and a few days. 
Sam sees a ranch warehouse door has been left open and goes to investigate it with his gun drawn. Later that night, Avery, in his recovered truck, plans on how to approach the club. Vladimir Putin approaches Avery and makes an implication that Club Merc is very shady. Cut to inside the club, where a mysterious except couple discuss the club glowers and the possibility of buying the place. We then return to Avery, who is making his move into the club. Avery runs into Jasmine near the rear entrance of the club. The two of them are approached by club security, who tell Avery he has to leave. One of the security guards places his hand on Avery to escort him away. Avery then fights the guards and defeats a third guard before demanding from a fourth guard that Darren be brought to him. The guard refuses, and Avery breaks into the club and does his best. Any man don't want to get killed, better clear on out the back. And once again, demands Darren's presence. More guards show up, and Avery quickly defeats them before Santuan reappears. Avery and Santuan step out into an alleyway for a rematch. Santuan attacks, but Avery shows he has a new ability that allows him to easily avoid being hit. The two of them fight, and Avery defeats Santuan when Avery smashes Santuan through a wall. The police arrive, and Avery flees to prevent himself from being taken into custody. Avery heads for Altona's house. Avery informs Altona that he had to flee from the cops and that he saw Jasmine. The two of them then discuss the plan for what to do moving forward before they are interrupted by Vassi, Altona's daughter. Avery tucks Vassi into bed, and she mentions that she thinks he's a superhuman because Avery seems so strong, something he quickly deflects. Altona shows Avery some footage of Jasmine the last time she was at work. Jasmine took a phone call and then seemed afraid of something. Altona speculates that maybe Jasmine owes Darren a debt, to which Avery responds that he does not care about Jasmine anymore, and he is concerned for Altona and Vassie's safety. Meanwhile, at Club Merc, Darren monologues about how his empire is still a work in progress, and how he'll keep a hold of it by any means before implying that he has put a hit out on Avery. The next morning, Avery meets with a man who turns out to be a superhero tailor. Avery requests his old super suit and becomes Isom once again. In an epilogue, we learn of Norfrica, a rock band whose members are excepts. I'm going to begin with the art. Cliff Richard's art style doesn't seem to stand out as anything unique to me. It just comes across as bland. I've seen better, and I've seen far, far worse. I noticed on more than a few occasions where his characters look the same as other characters. At first, I thought these two people in the club were the same as these two members of Alpha Corps. That is, until I took a moment to flip back and saw that they had different hairstyles from one another. Is this character supposed to be Jasmine? They are both drawn in a similar manner, and they have similar hair, but their earrings are different. I wouldn't be against picking up another comic that Richards did the art on, just as long as the story was good, but I'm not going to go out of my way to get something just because he did the art for it. Now on to the story. There's an old stereotype about comic books being a poorly done form of exploitive entertainment that are not meant to be taken seriously. When it comes to ISOM, that statement is a lie, because there is nothing entertaining about this comic. Reading this didn't feel fun, it felt like a chore. My favorite part was when I reached the back cover. It definitely shows that this is by someone who has no prior experience writing a story and probably didn't take the time to read up on the basics of how to form a plot and create characters. When I finished reading this for the first time, my initial thought was... It's miraculous. <laughs> I feel nothing. Nothing at all! <laughs> I don't feel invested in Isom as a story or invested in any of these characters. This book does not feel like a story. It just feels like a sequence of events that simply occur and we are forced to observe them. It's like if you were to go to a grocery store and saw a fight when you went down one aisle, and then saw an employee mopping the floor when he went down the next aisle. Just random occurrences connected by coincidence. There is no build-up and no tension in this story. The only reason things happen in this is because the writer of this poor excuse of a story makes them happen. I read this three times just to be sure that there wasn't something that I'm missing that's keeping me from understanding this story or its characters. Each time I read it, I discovered something new that had me stupefied. Ponderous, man. Ponderous. I was left with so many questions about the story and the characters when I finished reading this, but not in the good way when something interesting happens in the story and it hooks you. I loaned this book to a few friends for their takes, some who are into comics and some who are not. Only one of them was aware of I saw him. I thought there was a chance that I'm just crazy and there was goodness here that I'm overlooking and they could help me see it. For starters, none of them cared for it. One of them, an experienced published writer, said, I've never been ashamed of reading a comic in public at any point in my life until today. 
I was worried someone would ask me what it was about, and I wouldn't know how to describe it to them. My friends had all the same questions I was left with after reading I Saw Him. We didn't know what an XEP was until the part in the hospital made it sound like they were superhumans, but the exact definition is still vague after this scene. We thought we missed something when Yaira and Alpha Core showed up because their introductions are set up as if we are already supposed to know who these characters are and that we should feel excited to see them. One of my friends stated that she remembered Alpha Core being mentioned and wondering what it was. She felt like she missed dialogue saying who they were before they showed up, and said that Alpha Core not being referred to in a negative manner earlier in the story was the only thing that kept her from thinking that they were supervillains when they did appear. Based on the design of their uniforms and how they seem menacing on this half-page splash, I have to agree with her. Alpha Core is even shown fighting Isom on cover C, which is the edition I have. The only point of reference in the story we have to Alpha Core being good guys is when it is mentioned that they took Avery to the hospital after his fight with Yaira. Who are these people at the club? I understand that they are supposed to be mysterious, but the way they are written makes me feel like we're already supposed to know who they are. Which is it? My friends were all shocked that this is the first story in what is meant to be an extended universe. The reason both myself and my friends were left with so many questions was because it felt like we were missing key pieces of information that made us confused and frustrated about what we were reading. If this is how someone going in blind to this story feels, then how can Eric July expect to build an audience outside of his pre-established fanbase? How July went about this story is not mysterious. It's just him being a poor writer. There's a difference between a writer showing the audience everything up front and holding our hands, and a writer leaving the audience a breadcrumb hint here or there for us to follow. These hints give us a better understanding of the narrative, while keeping the story mysterious in an interesting way and creating excitement for what the narrative is building to. Or a writer can just keep vital information from the audience, hoping we can read their mind which causes a story to be more confusing than it needs to be. Which is exactly how this seems to be handled. There are plenty of times where a writer should be up front with their audience, especially when they are setting something up for a payoff later. The only time that really happens in this story is with Yaira. We get the teaser of, she's back, in the opening scene, and then we get the reveal later of who she is. As for the lack of setup and payoff, I'll start with the opening. On page one, change this right here, from this, to this. This message is clear and informs us that Alpha Corps is police affiliated. Later, when Yaira is fighting the cops and Alpha Corps shows up, we see who they are. Superhuman cops. The payoff. This is a much easier way to understand who these characters are, rather than waiting several more pages after they first appear for Yaira to clarify who Alpha Corps is supposed to be. Now moving on to Santuan. He first appears on story page 19, and we don't even learn his name until story page 63. If Santuan is supposed to be an important character, then why couldn't there have been a brief setup for him before he appears? It could have been easy. When Avery arrives at the club, there could have been a scene of Darren being told by someone off-panel that there's some guy outside demanding an audience with him, and if this mystery character should go out and take care of it. Darren could check a security monitor, see that it's Avery, and say, No, Santuan. I go way back with this guy. I'll see what he wants, but stay close and out of sight. We'd be left with the mystery of who this Santuan guy is, and then we get the payoff when we first see him. There is no setup for the second fight with Santuan. Avery goes back to the club to confront Darren, and Santuan just kind of shows up again to fight him. There was no build-up or tension leading to what we believe to be their second encounter. It's just something coincidental that happens. Something as simple as Avery saying that he wants a rematch where he won't hold back against Santuan would have worked to set this moment up. There's no setup as to why Avery wants his old super suit back and why he would become Isom again. There are just things he ends up doing with no clear purpose. When the term except was first used, I thought it was some real-world slang term that I just hadn't heard before. 32 story pages into this issue, we are given a possible idea of what an except is. This exposition should have happened on page 2 during the news broadcast. Whoever this person is on the TV could have said something like, I'd like to thank the local superhumans, known as Excepts, for their aid in reducing the crime rate. If you pay attention to the news, it always clarifies what the subject of a story is, and what something that's important to the news story is, even if that thing has become common knowledge. For example, 9-11 is always referred to in the news as the terrorist attacks that took place on September 11th, 2001. This is done in the off chance that there is someone out there who has no idea what happened on that day. This same method should be used in telling a fictional story if a writer wants their audience to easily understand what is going on. 
There's this part here during the first fight between Avery and Santuan. I just took Santuan's use of you as a generalization, as in people like you who are troublemakers. Then during the second fight we see between the two of them, Santuan mentions to Avery it is the third time the two of them have duked it out and how there will not be a fourth fight. When I saw this I thought, wait, is my copy missing a few pages or did I accidentally skip some of them? Or do these two have history prior to this story? Avery acknowledged that Santuan is an except when he showed up for the first time, but I just figured that Avery came to that conclusion due to the far larger than average size of Santuan when he first appeared, rather than the two of them having some undisclosed past. If they do have history, then why couldn't this have been established clearly when they first interacted? Once again, this is something that could have easily been done, and here's yet another fix to make the story more understandable. How I've presented this review up until now has been with the information I had the first two times reading this story. I started on a third reading as I began writing the script for this review and I finally read a page that I had previously ignored. Dokumon cards. Who is Dokumon and what's on the cards? A mysterious person by the name of Dokumon has been keeping up with notable subjects. They have cards with some important information about high profile subjects. The cards won't be around forever, so get them while you can if you want to learn more information about characters and the Ripaverse. Important information. Wait, what? I decided to go hunting. After a bit of searching, I found some very useful information. First, I found the reveal trailer for ISOM number one, and after seeing it, I learned that the term except is clearly defined in it as a superhuman, something that the story fails to do. I also learned that the story takes place in Texas, that my original pronunciation of this character's name as Yera was incorrect, and what Darren's last name is. Then after a bit more digging around, I found a post where someone had put the information from the Dokumon cards online. Most of the information on these cards is just basic background info on the characters that could be enough to generate interest in them if the cards didn't feel so blandly written. Darren's card gives us a good reason why Altona couldn't call the cops in regards to Jasmine going missing and Darren being a possible lead to her location. To sum it up, Darren is one of the most respected men in Flora's Park. Despite being shady, he is seen in a positive light and it is implied that he might be paying off the cops. The cards also gave me the identity of the club couple. Their names are Michael Copper and Lillian Ronashi. Michael seems to be a successful businessman and Lillian seems to be his business partner who hasn't been so lucky. So what I want to know is, if some of this info is so vital to understanding the story, then why isn't any of it in the story? Why is it paywalled behind a set of 11 trading cards that cost $100 and are no longer available? Now don't get me wrong, I love capitalism, and I understand wanting to put out collectibles, but at least make the bios for these characters available for free to view on the Ripaverse website, or preferably add them as supplemental pages in the back of this book. As I already said, sometimes in storytelling, a writer needs to be direct or leave the audience some breadcrumbs so we can at least know something. When important things like this are paywalled, a creator cheats their audience. Good God, this type of crap is inexcusable. I, I need a bit to cool down. <sighs> All right, folks, I'm better now. We can continue on. There could have been an easy setup for Copper and Ronashi within this story. When Darren sees Avery, he could have said that he has a meeting with Copper, so Avery needs to make what he has to say quick, to which Avery could have replied, I've heard of Copper, he's pretty big. After Avery's first fight in the club, Copper shows up and Darren apologizes to him for the mess, saying a troublemaker had shown up, but the situation was taken care of. Then we could get the scene later that night of Copper and Ronashi talking about buying the club. Once again, set up and pay off. Additional information I found about other characters came from a Reddit page that gave info that is otherwise only available in another piece of now unavailable material. It gave me the name of the tailor, which is Cedric Gaucho. This just would have been nice to know. A simple line when Avery approaches him could have been used to tell us who this new character is. This mustached fella from the start of the book is named Sergeant Mick Davies, and it seems he'll be given more focus in the future. The information on these characters is found in the limited edition concept art book that is only 14 pages long and had a cost of... 75 bucks? Jeez! All of this just makes me theorize that I had to already be in the know about things in the story when I came to it. There's so much in this story that is irrelevant and can be deleted to speed up the pace without affecting the main plot. 
The opening scene can be removed. Part of Avery's dialogue to Sam the Ranch Hand when we first see him can be deleted because it's not important. The pages with Yaira and Alpha Core can be cut because they go nowhere. The scenes that take place on the ranch when Avery is in Flora's part can be axed, partly because nothing happens and the third ranch scene mostly repeats information we were given on a previous page. The scene with Putin can be deleted because the scene implies that Club Merc is shady, which is info that should kinda be obvious after Darren's I'm the bad guy speech. This scene with Copper and Ronashi doesn't progress the story, so it's gone. The scene with Avery, Jasmine, and the two bouncers can be cut. Removing it would help build tension and make the mystery of what happened to Jasmine stronger. And Avery was headed back to the club anyways, so his absence wouldn't have changed anything that occurred next. The second page of Avery running from the club to Altona's house is not needed. The page where Avery and Altona discuss Jasmine for the last time can be removed, because our hero makes it clear that he doesn't care about the Jasmine situation at the end of it, making this scene completely meaningless. Most of the monologue in Darren's final scene can be removed. And finally, the epilogue featuring Norfrica can be cut. There's many more occurrences of deadweight panels and dialogue that can be removed from the story. It would just take too much of this video's runtime for me to go through and name each and every instance where it could happen. But some of those scenes are important to the story! To an extent, yeah, I will agree. But the ones that are important don't work how they are currently written and can be altered to where they work and are much shorter. Yaira dropping Avery on a taxi can be altered to him just landing on one with Santuan gives him a free flight across town. A caption can be added on the final panel of the first page of Avery running from the club with the internalization telling where he is going now. The scene of Avery and Altona talking about Jasmine being seen at work for the last time can stay, if Avery saying that he doesn't care about that situation anymore is removed. And finally, this scene with Darren. Remove most of this speech and replace it with this, which gets the same point across much faster. I also believe that the two club scenes could be merged together into a single scene. Avery could still lose to San Juan, and it would lead to the story having a decent climax. But more on that idea in a bit. All the issues I've mentioned so far with the story made me feel like July neglected to hire a story editor, and I saw while researching that he doesn't appear to have one on his staff. The point of a story editor is to give creative feedback to a writer, telling them what parts of a story work, how to improve the parts that don't work, and to make sure the story adheres to its own continuity. Every major TV show, movie, and book has had a story editor attached to it. For this next part, I'm going to get into the plot structure. This book is 94 pages long and has 83 pages of story. The average monthly comic book is 32 pages with 22 pages of story. Doing the math, I saw number one is a single page off from being the same length in story as four monthly single comic book issues. The average length of a story arc for monthly release titles tend to be between four to six issues, a range that this fits in. As a consumer, I'm wanting a complete story from a comic that is 94 pages long. It can be part of a greater arc, yes, but I want a complete story with a complete plot structure. The nine trade paperback volumes of Preacher by Garth Ennis and the late, great Steve Dillon are a good example of this. Each volume contains its own story that has a full plot structure, while all nine volumes manage to make up a greater story arc. It could be said that each volume is a subplot, or smaller stories within a larger narrative. The greatest crime of Isom's story is that it lacks a full plot structure, and I will prove it. This is it, folks. This is the basic structure a plot should follow. Chances are very high that you came across this diagram a few times throughout school. Forgive me for a few minutes while I play high school English teacher and break it down for you. First is the exposition. This is the beginning of the story where the setting, characters, and any possible MacGuffin, a title given to a person or object that is the driving force of the story, are introduced. For how TV shows, movies, and plays are written, this is the first act where the foundation is set and the inciting incident that sets the story in motion occurs. This is when we meet Peter Parker and he is bitten by a radioactive spider. Next is the rising action. This is when the main character starts their journey, makes allies, and goes through trials in a period of self-discovery. This would be the second act and most of the third act. This is the part of the story where the bad things happen and the characters start to struggle. This is when Admiral Kirk assumes command of the Enterprise and the ship sets out to intercept V'ger. After that is the climax. This is the most important part and what the whole story has been building to. This is where the outcome is decided. My high school theater teacher was the one who described this best. He said, This is the story's point of no return. After this moment, everything changes and things cannot go back to how they were before. This is the moment where the events around the characters and who the characters are as people are irreversibly changed by either a choice they make 
or from an external event that occurs to them. This is the Iron Man snap. Other examples include, Michael Corleone has the heads of the five families killed, damning himself to be a monster. Ash burns the Book of the Dead to defeat the evil force that killed his friends and turned his life into a nightmare. While killing Godzilla, Dr. Sarazawa sacrifices himself to ensure the secrets of his doomsday weapon do not fall into the wrong hands. And finally, the Rocketeer sabotages his own jetpack so Nazi James Bond can't take it back to the Third Reich to mass produce for their use in world domination. Getting close to the ending, there is the falling action. This is the part where the story starts to wind down and we see how the characters have been affected by the climax. This is the celebration at the Rebel base after the Death Star is destroyed. And finally, the resolution. This is just the end of the story, plain and simple. The cowboy rides off into the sunset. This is what the plot structure of this issue looks like. It starts out fine with the inciting incident of Avery getting the call to find Jasmine, who is the MacGuffin of this story. Then it moves on to the rising action, which is everything from when Avery leaves his ranch to the end of this issue. There is no climax. It just skips to the resolution of Avery putting on his old super suit again. His reasoning for this should have been the climactic moment in the story brought on by a clear choice that shows his growth as a character. But Avery's reasoning that led him to returning to his former alter ego again is because of the hell if I know. Avery becoming Isom again is just a change in duds. The way this moment is handled in the story is the equivalent of the third act wardrobe change in Batman and Robin, a visual change, and nothing more. The choice he made to return to the club and his choice to say that he did not care about what was going on with Jasmine were staying true to who this character already is. There's a way to fix the climax too. Remember what I said about merging the club scenes and having Avery still lose the fight with Santuan would make a decent climax? Here's how. We learn that Avery has been pulling his punches in the fight against Santuan to protect his identity as a former superhero. Darren could be there the whole time watching and then mention how if Avery keeps snooping around, then something bad is bound to happen to his sister and niece. Avery then gets tossed out of the club onto the street outside. After that moment, Avery realizes that there is nothing that he, a simple ranch owner, can do to help Jasmine and protect his family. But the superhero I saw him can do both of those things. This would be the moment where his character grows and changes. For an example of good plot structure within comics, I'm going to go way back. Back to the beginning, the Golden Age. Up in the sky, look! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Action Comics number one, Superman. Written by Jerry Siegel and art by Joe Shuster from 1938. This comic is 64 pages long, but only 13 of them are dedicated to the Man of Steel. That 13-page story is a masterclass in itself of plot structuring. This is the first page of that story. This single page by itself works as its own story. Now follow along with me as I break it down into its basic plot structure. Exposition. A baby is jettisoned from a doomed planet and lands on Earth. Rising action. While there is no conflict in this story, the baby, now going by Clark Kent, grows up going on a journey of self-discovery where he learns that he has amazing special abilities beyond those of normal men. Climax. Clark Kent makes the choice to use his special abilities to help others. Falling action and resolution. This is one of those situations where they go together, which does occur from time to time. Clark Kent takes on the identity of Superman, champion of the oppressed, the physical marvel who has sworn to devote his existence to helping those in need. By the end of this page, we have a clear idea of who Superman is and what his motivations are. But let's continue on. The reading I did of the Superman story for this video, I noticed that it is actually unofficially broken up into five distinct vignettes, or a short story that can be read on its own, but can be part of a larger story. This includes the single page origin story. The only thing connecting the stories together is a panel or two that allow the stories to flow into one another. So let's continue on with this story. Vignette 2. Superman rushes to the governor's mansion with a woman under his arm. When Superman reaches the mansion, he demands from a butler to have an audience with the governor. Superman says that an innocent woman is about to be executed, and the woman he has with him is the true culprit of the crime that the jailed woman is convicted of. The butler refuses, and Superman barges in. After the butler makes attempts to stop him, Superman makes it to the governor, and they speak of the jailed woman. The governor makes a choice to believe this stranger in a funny outfit who can do things beyond that of the common man, and he has the jailed woman pardoned just in the nick of time. We learn more about Superman during this story. Superman will do whatever he can to save someone, to make the truth known, and to see justice served. 
Vignette 3. The next morning, we meet up with Clark Kent, and we learn that he works as a reporter. Clark goes to work, talks to his editor, which is something Eric July wouldn't know about, and he learns the world has become aware of Superman's existence. Clark hears of a domestic incident happening nearby, rushes to the scene as Superman, and stops the man from beating his wife. In this vignette, we learn why Superman works as a reporter. It's to learn of crimes as they happen, and by intervening on a domestic incident, we learn that no crime is too small for Superman's attention. Vignette 4. Back at the newspaper, we are introduced to lady reporter Lois Lane. She reluctantly accepts going out to dinner with Clark. When a tough guy cuts in on their evening, Clark immediately folds, but Lois takes care of the situation herself and leaves. Noticing the tough guy and his gang following Lois, Clark changes into Superman and follows them. The gang kidnaps Lois and Superman comes to her rescue. At this moment, we learn why Superman was smashing a car on the front cover. For once, the cover of a comic actually happens in the story. Anyways, Superman and Lois meet for the first time during this rescue, and Superman takes Lois back to the city. This vignette teaches us the links that Clark will go to to keep his true identity secret, even if it makes him look weak to the people around him. We also get a good idea of who Lois Lane is in this brief appearance. Lois doesn't really care much for Clark because she views him as a sniveling weakling, and she's clearly able to take care of herself when she needs to. Vignette 5. The next day, Clark is sent on assignment to the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. While there, Clark overhears a conversation between a congressman and a seedy character. He then learns that the seedy character is a lobbyist who buys off congressmen on behalf of a mysterious benefactor. Some things just never change. Superman tells the congressman to a meeting with the lobbyist. Superman nabs the lobbyist and takes him for a run around town in order to scare who his benefactor is out of him. The story ends with the appearance that Superman and the lobbyist are going to fall to their deaths. Although a cliffhanger, there is still a form of falling action and resolution to this story, and the end leaves us interested in what happens next. Five distinct segments working together to tell one story. And I'll say that it was a joy to reread this story for making this video. But I don't see how those work together to form a whole story. Well then, here it is. The plot structure for the story as a whole would start with Superman's origin as the exposition. The adventures he goes on are the rising action, Choosing to take a stand against corruption in the government is the climax. The following action is when Superman interrogates the lobbyist. And finally, the resolution is when Superman fails a jump and the two of them begin plummeting to the ground. See you next time, boys and girls. I saw him as the first part of a story arc. Of course it's not going to have a full plot structure. Alrighty. I'll do this full plot structure breakdown thing one last time. And I'll use a story that is one chapter of a six-part arc. The Amazing Spider-Man number 33, written by J. Michael Straczynski and art by John Romita Jr. from 2001. This is the fourth in a six-part story. Exposition. The story starts in the streets of Manhattan, mid-fight. Spider-Man is there internalizing about how this Dracula-looking fella, Morlin, is much tougher than he looks, and old Pete's having a rough time with him. The rising action. They fight. During a break in the action, Morlin tells Spider-Man that he will kill him. They fight some more. Spider-Man gets his ass beat and makes a run for it. He takes a breather on a nearby building, but Morlin catches up to Spider-Man and they both go tumbling off the roof. Spider-Man escapes at the last moment as Morlin splats on the sidewalk. Morlin grabs a pedestrian and starts absorbing her life force to recharge himself. This makes it clear why Morlin wants to kill Spider-Man. It's so he can absorb Spider-Man's life force. Spider-Man saves the pedestrian before it's too late for her. Round 3. A once again vested Spidey runs yet again. Spider-Man steals some street clothes in order to go incognito as Peter Parker. Huh, Jameson is right. He is a menace. Anyway, Morlin still finds him. Morlin attacks Peter and they spill into a diner where they fight for one last time in this issue. Morlin gets thrown into a kitchen where a gas oven is busted. Climax. Seeing our favorite web swinger approaching, Morlin lights a match and... I thank God every day I didn't get exploded. An injured Spider-Man realizes how screwed he really is when he sees Morlin survive the blast and is unharmed. Falling action. Beaten and exhausted, Spider-Man flees to meet with someone he believes can help him against this foe. Resolution. Spider-Man meets up with that person who tells Spider-Man that there is nothing he can do to help Spider-Man against Morlin and that Peter is doomed. Doomed! See? It works. The basic plot structure is still there. We still have a single story within a greater arc. 
I'll tell you right now that 12 year old Jesse had no trouble at all understanding what was going on or who the main characters were. I already had a clear idea who Spider-Man was as a character going into this story due to watching the animated series during the 90s. However, Morlin, a character I had never heard of before and who was created for this art, 12 year old Jesse had a clear idea who he was supposed to be after reading this. There was still a mystery as to why Morlin was so powerful and how he was able to track Spidey so easily, but that would all be answered in the following issue. The character motivations are pretty clear. Spidey is just fighting for his own survival against a seemingly unstoppable foe. Morlin wants to absorb Spider-Man's life force to sustain himself. The moment in this that changes who Spider-Man is as a character is when he sees Morlin is alive and realizes how truly dire the situation is. It's not really much when it comes to character growth, but it's there and also a very common form of character growth for a superhero story. This is the comic book that started me reading comics on the regular as a child and probably the single issue I have read the most times. The ending of this story left me interested in what might happen next, which led me to buy the next issue, and then the issue after that, which ends the arc. But even that issue ended on a cliffhanger with Peter's Aunt May learning who her nephew really is, and that story is picked back up on in issue number 37, which I also bought. I was hooked. Spider-Man soon became my favorite superhero, and I also started following other characters and stories I was interested in when preteen and teenage me had the extra money. One of my main hobbies started all because a 12 year old boy picked up a random story and it was written in an easily understandable and intriguing manner. Now that is what good writing can accomplish. Other issues with this story lie with the characters. I'm sure Eric July has a clear idea who these people are supposed to be, but it doesn't translate to the page. None of them really feel unique and they all read the same. One character's bad dialogue could be changed for another character's and it wouldn't matter. Anyone could be saying anyone else's words. As for who the characters are, Altona. She is only there to give exposition. Her motive for wanting to find Jasmine is because they know each other. Them being friends is only implied and not clearly defined. Jasmine. She is this story's MacGuffin. This story starts out as a mystery about what happened to her, but that plotline is quickly dropped shortly after being introduced for reasons I'll explain later. Mrs. Newman. This unseen character is Jasmine's mother. Her name is invoked by Altona to guilt Avery into looking for Jasmine. This character is mentioned on a few occasions, and it's treated as if she is supposed to hold some great emotional weight on the characters and the audience. But the reason why we should feel this way is never expanded upon outside of us being told that she is related to Jasmine. Darren Fontano. He is an extremely one-dimensional villain. Just a case of, insert, mob boss, here. A good writer would make the scene that introduces the villain and the first time the hero interacts with them feel as tense as possible and make it clear how high the stakes are. Eric July, however, is not one of those writers. Two pages after Darren appears in what should be an important scene, Darren starts into a monologue that turns into him practically saying, I am evil! The only thing missing from this monologue is the Baron Harkonnen laugh. When Darren appears again, his monologue on building an empire is really just him pointing at himself and saying, Now don't you forget! I am evil! Evil! Let's kill Avery. There is nothing that comes across as intriguing to me about Darren. This character does make his motivation clear, and that motivation is... Because I'm evil! Beyond that flat reasoning, I have no idea why he does what he does. There are plenty of flat villains out there. One of the most popular supervillains, the Joker, is one of them. He points at himself and declares himself a villain, but he relishes it and challenges you to stop him. The reason he works and he became so popular is because he's unpredictable and makes evil look fun. Love that Joker. Every once in a while someone will come along and give him some added dimension, but the Joker always ends up reverting back to his flat state. When it comes to more complex villains, a good example is Magneto. As a Holocaust survivor, he has experienced the evil that man can do to those who are different. He sees the parallels with how mutant kind is being treated to what happened to him in the past. This has caused him to preemptively lash out against his perceived aggressors. While Magneto does the wrong thing, we understand his reasoning and even at times sympathize to an extent as to why he does what he does. Santuan, he is yet another one-dimensional villain. This character gave me vibes that July was trying to replicate the Barracuda, but San Juan really is just your run-of-the-mill, overly confident, meathead henchman. No idea what his motivation is supposed to be. All of these characters. It felt to me like I was supposed to care about them just because they were there. Motivations unknown. Vassy. She is there in a feeble attempt to force some heart into this story and make it look as though Avery cares about his family, which seems to contradict what we have learned about him thus far. 
Sam. He is a ranch hand, and what I call an uncharacter. An uncharacter is someone who has no purpose within the story that is given too much focus. Cedric Gaucho. He is yet another uncharacter who only talks about how his business is successful and expanding. You could have easily changed this scene out with Avery getting his super suit back from Altona who has been keeping it in a shoebox somewhere after Avery retired from Heroics. And now finally, the most important character, Avery Silman. I'm not sure who this character is meant to be. His primary motivations are made clear through his actions, but I don't think his perceived motivations are what Eric July intended them to be. The information we are given is contradictory to how he acts. During their brief talk, this dialogue from Darren breaks down Avery's character as an underachiever who comes across as humble, both traits that traditionally work for someone who is meant to be shown as heroic. But when Altona called Avery earlier for help, his instant reaction was to say no. He doesn't even know what Altona is going to ask. It could have been a simple, I suddenly have to go out of town on business for a few days. Can I drop Vassy off at your place until I get back? Or something more serious like, I just learned I have six months to live. Please make sure my daughter is raised right. If this man's family is as important as we are later led to believe, he has a weird way of showing it. This moment, however, is in line with how he is presented for the rest of the story. How we see Avery act through this is as a stubborn, hot-headed jerk who stands for nothing. With the exception of when he bumps into Yaira, Avery is the aggressor in every violent situation he is involved in. Avery was told to leave the club, which Darren was well within his legal right to do for whatever reason he chooses. Avery's response was to assault his escort and escalate the situation. Avery then begins to approach Darren in a threatening manner, to which the rest of security move in to protect their employer. Here's the first guy that approaches Avery. Avery was eventually ejected from the club after continuing to make the situation worse. Then later that night, yeah, these men did place their hands on Avery, but he once again escalated the situation rather than defusing it. He could have easily walked away and snuck back later, but he ended up attacking these men. Even without this scene, I have no doubt that what happens next would have still occurred, because this is what we have learned is true to Avery's character. He then goes to the rear entrance of Club Merc, preemptively assaults two more members of security before using one of them as a battering ram to force entry into the club. He ends up terrorizing the club patrons and then fights more security guards. So why did Avery cause all this mayhem? We know Avery bumped into Jasmine at one point, so this isn't a case of him learning her location and making a selfless attempt to save her. This all happened because he felt disrespected. The hero of this story selfishly abandons the story's MacGuffin because he's upset that he was talked down to by Darren. This character is a snowflake. Avery's motivations come from vanity and narcissism. The demand to be respected is a sign of vanity. Vanity is a common trait among supervillains. Take this moment just before the second, I I'm sorry, third fight with Santuan. You can take Avery's dialogue and give it to Doctor Doom and it fits especially since old Victor views himself as a hero. Let me remind you that Avery even tells his sister that he isn't concerned about Jasmine anymore after his rampage at the club. Jasmine could be in danger and is possibly being forced into prostitution against her will, and Avery does not care about helping her because his feelings were hurt. He is a narcissist because he fully sets aside checking on the well-being of another to settle a personal vendetta over a social slight. It wouldn't be an issue to me if these were purposeful character traits that Avery ends up overcoming as part of his character arc, but I find that doubtful, because a good writer would have had another character calling Avery out for these behaviors as a setup. Avery's demand for respect makes me think of that moment in Man of Steel when the jerk in the bar pours his beer on Clark's head only for the character that this movie claims is Superman to respond by destroying the man's truck. Moments like these feel wrong because superheroes tend to be written to be our moral superiors that we should strive to be, even when they have feet of clay. Yes, there are superheroes who are selfish, but they are either written with the trait of something they need to overcome for a greater good, they are presented as the butt of the joke, or they are unlikable intentionally. Batman might be a broody, paranoid, and selfish jerk, but he will still put himself in harm's way to save someone because it is the right thing to do, even if that person is one of his enemies. He is a hero at heart, even if he refuses to acknowledge it. When our heroes act in a selfish manner, fate tends to step in and punish them for that transgression. Batman will always have tension with his allies because of his selfish obsession with his war on crime. Spider-Man's beloved Uncle Ben was killed when he refused to stop a robber. Even Superman has been guilty of this. He once put protecting the planet aside to play house with Lois Lane in the Fortress of Solitude, going as far as having his powers removed so he could live life as a normal man with Lois. 
During his time away, evil Kryptonian fugitives took over the planet. After returning to civilization, Clark Kent learns of this invasion and returns back to the Fortress of Solitude in an attempt to have his powers restored. In exchange of having his powers returned to him, Superman's selfishness was then punished by him forever losing his direct connection to his lost home planet of Krypton and to his father. The other two traits that we are told Avery has are ambition and stubbornness. And we sure get to see these. We see him be stubborn in his refusal to be the better man in the situation and let Darren's insult go, as a hero would. We see Avery's ambition because he'll do whatever he can to teach Darren a lesson for disrespecting him. July claims to have grown up reading and loving superhero comics, but he has made it clear with this single story that he does not understand what has caused modern superhero characters to have endured in the public consciousness for close to a century. Is Avery supposed to be an anti-hero? Not a problem to me if he is. I like me a well-done anti-hero. I just want it to be clear what type of character I'm supposed to be dealing with. A common complaint I've seen about Avery is that his abilities are being kept secret and will be revealed as the story progresses. So far we've seen super strength, durability, and what might be speed or agility. Who knows what is coming next? Eric wants mystery, so he's not going to give away everything about Avery's character or his powers from the start. There's nothing wrong with having mystery surrounding a character, but there is a right way to do it that still gives an audience a clear understanding of the type of person the character is meant to be. My personal favorite example of this can be seen in Eric Powell's dark comedy, The Goon. By the end of the first story about The Goon, we have a basic grasp of who the character is. He's a stubborn, short-tempered, and tough-as-nails mob enforcer. In the following issues, we learn that despite being a mobster, the goon and his psychic Frankie will do whatever it takes to protect Lonely Street and its citizens, even if it all is in the name of protecting their favorite pub. We also see that the goon is a world-weary character as we learn the tragic events of his origin. The goon was abandoned by his parents as a child and was raised by his aunt, a carnival strongwoman. Life in the carnival was rough, but the goon was a happy child. One day, the mob boss Labrazio arrived at the carnival to extort the owner into paying back a favor. Labrazio hid within the carnival to avoid a police dragnet. Learning of who this new stranger was, a curious the goon enters Labrazio's trailer one night to learn more about him. The police learn of Labrazio's location and close in to pinch him. During an attempt to escape, the goon is caught in a crossfire between Labrazio and the police. During the shootout, the goon's aunt is accidentally gunned down while trying to rescue him. Labrazio kills the police in the confusion, and the goon takes his revenge on Labrazio for his aunt's death. The goon then chose to abandon the life he enjoyed at the carnival due to feeling responsible and guilty for his aunt's death. Now in possession of a book of Labrazio's records, the goon traveled to the unnamed city and Lonely Street to run the dead mobster's racket under the guise of a mob enforcer, because a life of crime is all he felt worthy of after his perceived failure. What happened to the goon as a child didn't have nearly as much of an effect of molding him into the jaded and broken man he is compared to the seed that was planted at the end of the first issue. Man, that was a bad night. Gotta admit though, it wasn't as bad as Chinatown. Boy, that was a real Frankie. Don't even bring up Chinatown. As the series continued, we would see this event referenced every so often. Chinatown. 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 Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. We would even get hints about what happened, and we would see how much this event is something the goon would rather not talk about whenever it was brought up. Then after 25 issues, we finally got the Chinatown story as its own graphic novel. I'm not going to spoil this, but I'll say it was a story worthy of the build-up, and it is heartbreaking. This is a great example of what I've been saying about a writer leaving breadcrumb hints for an audience to follow. We get nothing like this for Avery. No possible hints that could explain why he left the heroic life behind, and what might have caused him to become a selfish jerk. As for Avery's powers, I don't really care what they might all turn out to be when fully revealed. I'm more concerned about the issues I've stated with his characterization. A character with a unique special ability can create interest, but that interest will go only so far when the character is written poorly. However, what powers Avery has in keeping them a secret is an issue from a storytelling point of view, and we've already seen it happen in this story. This is the panel I'm talking about. Remember how I said in the plot summary, Avery shows he has a new ability, and how I said what might be speed or agility when listing the powers we've seen? If Avery has had the ability to do whatever this is the whole time, then why didn't he just do this in the previous fight? Is he dodging and Cliff Richards just left out the motion lines? Is he phasing through Santuan like Kitty Pride? Is he teleporting like Nightcrawler? Because any one of those three look pretty plausible to me. Since when could you do that? Is all we get in response to whatever it is Avery did. What the hell is even that? Yes, I am well aware that ghosting is a technique used by artists to show speed and motion. But the thing is, if Avery was only dodging, 
then why did Santuan seem so shocked by Avery's use of a basic defensive technique? Whatever it was Avery did, this moment makes me think of the 1966 Batman show. This is like that time Batman and Robin were tied to a giant catapult that had fire burning through the launch rope and Batman pulled out a hidden remote control to the Batmobile that we had never seen before so it can drive to the location where they'll go splat to deploy a net to save them at the last second. But that was done as a joke in a TV show that was a deadpan comedy. This is the problem with a writer not being upfront with their readers about what a character can do when that character is already aware of such things. It just feels like a cheat code that the writer can use to get their characters out of a situation when they have written themselves into a corner. I can see it now. Avery is surrounded with no possible escape. Then we learn that he has super halitosis and he uses his bad breath to knock out the bad guys to escape. While I pray that Avery is not able to do that in particular, I could see Eric July pulling such a move, but done with the same earnestness as that time Superman was given the ability of a mind-erasing kiss as a plot convenience to make Lois Lane forget that Superman is Clark Kent. This is the deus ex machina, which is often poorly done and one of the laziest tropes in writing. If a writer gives the readers a strong reason to care about the characters they have created, they'll find that their audience will also start enjoying the world that they exist in. Speaking of which... This issue is more focused on building up the world. So don't worry about the poor characterizations. First, world building should never be used as an excuse for why a story has poorly done characters. Whether a world works or not is dictated by the characters it's filled with. The world of Star Trek, though hope-filled, brimming with amazing technology and endless adventure, would have all been for naught if the crew of the Enterprise wasn't made of intriguing characters. Second, there's not really much when it comes to world building in this story. We are given some exposition that superheroes exist at the beginning, and then we see a few of them in scenes that feel shoehorned in. That's it. There's nothing that really sets this world apart from any of the others in the oversaturated superhero genre, which is something that leaves this one feeling unoriginal and boring. Once again, I'll use The Goon as a good example of storytelling being done right. The first story opens with this blurb. This is Lonely Street, zombie territory. The zombie priest had come to town to build a crime family from the dead. Every time a mob war began, his numbers grew until his family's power was second only to Labrazio's. Even with the priest's unlimited supply of soldiers, Labrazio remained in control due to his number one enforcer, the Goon. This is the same thing as the Star Wars opening crawl. It gives a brief background to who the characters are and what is going on. But there's more. As we read this story, we learn that this world is filled with all sorts of creatures and weird monsters. This world ends up feeling fun, and as if anything can happen, no matter how off the wall. This has been a trend that has left me wanting to return to Lonely Street, even at times when the story has leaned into being more dark and depressing. We've all seen the disaster that can happen when someone tries to cram all their world building into a single story, whether any of you out there want to admit it or not. World building should feel subtle, take time, and feel organic. World building works better if a writer just hints at other characters that exist and events that have occurred, with those ideas being gradually built up in future stories. We didn't need Isom, Yaira, Alpha Core, these people, and Norfolk all crammed into 83 pages of story. We are given way too much in Isom when it comes to character introductions as part of world building, and it just makes this story feel too busy and unfocused. Here's a few examples of how less is more world building could have worked in this story. The news broadcast at the beginning could mention the except cops known as Alpha Core and some mission they just completed, and it could just be left at that. Avery could see a poster advertising that Norfrica will be playing in Flores Park soon, and then internalize that he's been hearing a lot of good things about that band, and some weird things about the frontman and lead guitarist. I mentioned earlier how Copper and Ronashi could be implemented in this way. And lastly, while Avery is making his way to Darren's club at night, he could see Yaira fly across the sky with some people proclaiming that she's back, and someone else could say that her re-emergence is something that Alpha Corps will not be happy to hear. This would be a better way to hint at what is to come and to make the world feel more lived in. It's also pretty basic that characters who are meant to hold some sort of great importance are given their own standalone stories before you start moving into crossovers. This is a lightning round where I'm just going to get nitpicky and laugh at the ineptitude of this story because I couldn't find anywhere else in this video to make these bits fit. The opening splash page, this caption of two weeks ago is not needed. Flores Park is a terrible name for a city. It sounds more like a national forest where I'd spend a weekend camping and hiking rather than the name of a major metropolitan area. The reveal of Silman Ranch, the caption right here of earlier, can be removed. Is it earlier today or earlier than two weeks ago? If the two weeks ago on the front page is gotten rid of, then this works. Have one or the other. Don't have both. You do not reassure someone that you are going to shoot them. You warn them they will be shot. 
Then you reassure them that they'll get to the hospital in time before they bleed out. It should be Alpha Core, not Alpha Core. The core is the center of something, or something that is integral to structure. A core is a group of people, like the press corps or the marine corps. This moment right here. As I already joked, this man is dead. The fans of this book claim that this guy later on is the same character and his ribs were just cracked. I honestly think this is a retcon attempt. Look at them then we see him laying in a pool of it on the ground in the next panel like he's trying to hold his guts in. He was a hair away from looking like he got in a fight with Lloyd Christmas during a daydream, and he's back at work later that night with those large dreads in a teeny tiny bun. Even if this dude's ribs were only cracked by Avery's assault, when you crack your ribs, you're not going to want to do anything the rest of the day. I'm sure there'll be another retcon saying that this guy was an exit. Personally, I think it's just another case of characters drawn by Cliff Richards having similar looks to one another. What does this mean? Is it implying that Avery trained himself into having superpowers? Is that how it works in this world? This bit reminds me of a guy I went to college with who told me of an idea he had that I wish I could understand how it made sense to him. The idea was a story where the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were turned into humans by the Shredder, and then they trained themselves back into being turtles. As if their ninja training is what makes them mutant turtles. If a publisher wants to put an ad in their comic, that's fine by me. However, with the price people are paying for this book, it shouldn't be placed in the middle of the story. This should have been put at the very end, even past the Yara teaser and Eric July shilling his band. The second ranch scene, why is Sam already planning to have Avery, his boss, replaced? Avery has only been gone for a few hours. This is a tired joke. I saw it coming as soon as Avery was shown in a hospital gown. The only thing that surprised me is that it took so long to happen. Back to the second ranch scene real quick. It's the lighter side of dusk. The next scene, Flores Park, the tail end of dusk, almost night. No problems there. But then the next page, back on the ranch, it is once again the lighter side of dusk. Now at the start, it said that the ranch was on the outskirts of Flores Park, which tells me that it's really not that far from the city, maybe 30 minutes to an hour away in the countryside, as that is what being on the outskirts means. I can testify to this having grown up on the outskirts of a city. Even if the ranch is to the west of Flores Park, it should be nearly as dark at the ranch as what it is in the city. This moment wins the book the Plan 9 from Outer Space Continuity Award. Avery says in this scene that he's been in his truck planning how to approach the club for hours. When he arrives at the club, he says he doesn't have a plan and he's going to improvise what he's going to do. Then what was the point of having him say that he had spent hours coming up with a plan? This tells me that Avery is an idiot on top of being a selfish narcissist. We have this fellow right here who Avery smashes head first on the concrete sidewalk. He too has joined the choir invisible like his dreadlock buddy, or has at least been left with severe brain damage. Just look at him there, bleeding all over the sidewalk with his pal. And remember, their only crime was doing their jobs and keeping undesirables away from the club and its employees. This right here. Nice looking splash page, right? This is the first panel on the next page. Why is the mid-air clash between Avery and Santuan leading up to this moment not shown? Yes, we all know what happened, but this is an action sequence, so show the action. This is poor visual storytelling. The clash should have at least been its own half-page splash. Why does Avery get upset that the cops were trying to arrest him after his last fight with Santuan? They just saw Avery smash Santuan through a wall and then stand over him saying that he will kill Santuan if he gets back up. If I were a police officer, it would kind of seem obvious to me who the aggressor is in that situation. Darren is flagging the woman who may or may not be Jasmine with his gun. This is a grievous violation of basic gun safety. Eric July is an admitted gun owner, and he knows better. When Avery begins talking to Cedric the tailor, we have this part right here. Okay, a tease. That's cool. Some setup for something. Then on the next panel, we are told how Cedric knows who Avery is, making the tease that just happened completely pointless. Superheroes having tailors is nothing new, but Cedric ends up saying the same thing as Edna from The Incredibles about being dissatisfied with his previous work. This page here, its current placement interrupts the flow of the epilogue. It should either be here, or preferably here, after this epilogue. This is the incorrect word. This is Calvary, also known as Golgotha, the Mount of <laughs> This here is the Cavalry which is what Eric July was trying to say. This right here, this is the biggest joke of all. Rules like these tend to be broken, and if you ask me, they limit creativity as well. I felt like I saw number one was a first draft, but surely that couldn't have been true. If what I've heard is correct, Eric July is a first-time writer, and most stories from first-timers tend to be garbage even with multiple drafts. 
There have been so many comics I have read over the years that I felt had some good concepts, but were overall mediocre and in need of another draft. I can imagine the tight deadlines and any possible workload on other titles probably cause a writer to be unable to do more than a draft or two of a story. Comic publishers having such deadlines probably play a big part in why a lot of comics turn out feeling mediocre at best, and why we will see an actually talented writer quickly rise to getting the bigger named titles. In other words, the cream will rise to the top, oh yeah. I'm no authority on the matter, and I'm just guessing about all this. But I would be very interested in learning the truth if anyone working in the industry happens to be watching this and dropped a comment on it. But getting back on track, I'd still rather read one of those mediocre comics than I saw them. Then I got on Twitter one day while taking a break from writing this script and learned how many drafts this story actually went through. When you wrote I Saw Him 1, how many rewrites, if any, did you go through and at what point did you know, okay, this is the one? Full rewrites? None. Slide edits? Several. One thing you learn in music that crosses over is abandoning trying to be perfect. Something is fundamentally wrong if you have to go back tweaking every story thing afterwards. At some point there's diminishing returns and overproduction. I was left with this feeling of being shocked that he admitted that and, to me at least, seemed proud of it. And I also felt not at all surprised that what I speculated was true. Starting in elementary school, it was made clear that any major writing project, whether an essay or fiction, should be drafted at least twice and peer-reviewed between drafts. Handing in the first draft of an essay was always part of the English grade in both primary school and my time in college. It was then followed by a session of editing and revising. The point I am just trying to get across here is that drafting is a basic fundamental of writing. If what I understand is correct, I saw number one was already being printed when pre-orders opened. That means Eric July had plenty of time to write multiple drafts of the story. It's not as though he's working for some big company with strict deadlines that need to be adhered to. This also means that he could have, and should have, taken the time to find a story editor to give him notes. Or he could have just found someone he already knows that he can trust to be critical but honest and give their honest thoughts on his story. Raven's Last Hunt by J.M. DeMatteis and Mike Zeck, one of the greatest Spider-Man stories ever told, is a fourth draft. The first version was a failed pitch to Marvel for a miniseries about Wonder Man and his archenemy half-brother, the Grim Reaper. The second and third drafts were failed pitches to DC for Batman stories. One of those pitches involved the Joker, and the other had Hugo Strange. The fourth pitch was the Spider-Man story we ended up getting. Their original idea for that story was heavily revised between pitches until it finally became the story we now have. I do agree with what was said in that tweet about how striving for perfection and over tweaking can cause harm, but rather than perfection, what I've been striving for with this video is, is this something I would want to watch if somebody else made it? I have no doubt that's what Eric July had in mind with ISOM. You have to ask though, would he have reacted positively to ISOM if it were an IP and story created by someone else? This script I am recording right now has been drafted twice and self-edited for content. It was then given to a trusted friend for additional content notes, given a third draft, and then given another edit. While recording this script now, I have made additional edits to fix issues with the flow, and I've altered certain parts to make them sound better when spoken out loud. There's even been more than a few ad-lib lines that have come to me while recording this. I would have been ashamed to have put my first draft of this script out as the final version of this video. I doubt he'll watch this, but I'm going to take this moment to speak to Eric July directly. It's not hyperbole to say that a publishing company relies on good stories to stay in business. Eric, you owe it to your fans, potential future customers, and most importantly, the people that work for you to learn to be better at telling a story. Being able to do that takes time and educating yourself about the basics of storytelling. I say this being a person who, what feels like a lifetime ago, wanted to be a writer and director, and took creative writing courses and read various books about plot structure and developing characters and their motivations. Well, looks like we got ourselves a reader. You can even find videos about crafting those very things for free on YouTube. Eric, if you want to compete with the other comic publishers out there, you need to be able to tell stories that meet and exceed what the competition is already doing. If you don't, then your company will die. Hype of being new and different will only get you so far. Just look at what happened to Image in the years after they started. While that company is still around, Image is not the threat to the big two that it once was in the early 90s. And Image was a company started by a group who had experience in the comic industry. 
Eventually, the hype around your company will die down, and you'll have fans walking away from you for your inferior stories, like fans have been walking away from the big two for their inferior stories. I'm gonna take some time now to talk about the cost of this book. I Saw Number 1 cost $35, plus the cost of shipping, which came out to a grand total of $42.50 for me. That seems pretty steep for only 94 pages, and to think, my script editor and I have complained about Marvel Epic Collections having a $40 price tag for 300 pages. I Saw Number 1 has the standard glossy trade paperback pages, but the cover of my copy had this cheap and rough feel to it, and the binding already seems to be getting loose. I recently bought the special edition of The Crow by James O'Barr. It is a hardcover that is 272 pages and cost me $28 brand new after taxes and shipping. If you put aside everything I've said about ISOM, just based on that comparison of price and number of pages, what sounds like the better deal? Just a brief aside here that The Crow was also by a first-timer, and while The Crow is not a perfect story, it is a far superior story to ISOM. I know ISOM number one was printed right here in the US of A, which definitely plays a role in the high cost, and Eric July is running a small business with people to pay. But the low quality of the story itself does not make it worth the price of entry. I'd feel less guilty about the money I spent on ISOM if there would have been an option to buy a $10 or $15 PDF copy. If this story were better, I would have felt like it was more worth paying the price to support a small business providing something manufactured right here at home. Once again, if July really wants to be a competing force within the comic industry, he needs to have pricing that is competitive along with an intriguing story. July will always have extremely loyal people who will buy his books no matter what, but eventually, the high cost of an inferior product will drive a lot of people away. All my negative criticisms aside, I do find it admirable that someone formed their own publishing company and successfully released a comic. According to an article on the Ripiverse website published January 16th, 2023, ISOM number one had raised 3.7 million bucks and shipped over 60,000 copies by that point. I'm curious as to what those updated numbers look like at the time of this recording, which is early July 2023. At the end of May 2023, it was announced that veteran comic writer Chuck Dixon, best known for his runs with Batman and The Punisher during the 90s, will be writing an Alpha Core series. A Yair series will also be released with the creative team of the Twisted Twins, Jen and Sylvia Soska, who are known best for their indie horror movies and a Black Widow run. With experienced writers joining the Ripiverse, it gives me hope that maybe we'll see something better from this company than what we got from the inaugural book. More importantly, I hope Eric July used some of the money he's made to add a good story editor to his staff as well. I have wondered if the reason Eric July wrote I Saw Number 1 himself was because he couldn't afford to hire an experienced writer to use a provided plot outline to tell a gripping story. With the hiring of experienced writers, I was thinking, with this happening, maybe he'll announce a new writer for I Saw 2. But that didn't happen. With pre-orders for the second issue open, we all know that July is the writer for that one too. Just based on my opinions of this book, I hope he does hand over writing duties of ISOM to an experienced writer soon, and Eric July can go behind the scenes doing the basic plotting for the stories he wants to see, running the business, and just continuing to be the face of Ripiverse Publishing. The story title of Ill-Advised has turned out to be coincidentally descriptive. I would say it is ill-advised for anyone to read this. I can't in good conscience recommend ISOM number one. It really feels like what the general public believes comic books are, but manages to be worse. It also manages to be worse than what is already available to read today, despite Eric July's wish of ISOM being a superior book from the conservative counterculture. The rating I'll give ISOM number one is one out of five. The way this book has been pushed and the fandom that has developed around it gives me the vibes of the same old, same old Don't ask questions, just consume product and then get excited for next product that the large corporations have been pushing with their entertainment for years. But if you're curious about ISOM number one and aren't worried about wasting around 40 bucks, then go for it. If that's too rich for your blood for only 94 pages, but you really want to read it, then just ask around on social media to see if there's anyone who didn't like it and might be interested in selling their copy on the cheap. You could also wait for the speculation bubble to burst on the ridiculous prices some sellers are asking for on eBay. Always remember, something is only worth what another person is willing to pay for it. I personally feel that with how the comic industry is right now, the best thing to do if you want a good story you've never experienced before is to look to the past. There is always a well-regarded story out there that you haven't read, and it's just a Google search away from being found. I will highly recommend The Goon as a good starting point for a newcomer to comics, or to a longtime comic fan just looking for a good read. Anything else I have mentioned or shown here in this video, I would also recommend to anyone. Well, couldn't we just buy, like, a Japanese one? 
Bobby, go to your room. Also take a look at what other countries might have to offer as well, and you will find something far, far better written and more entertaining than this. I'm embarrassed to say that I'm the guy who is willing to give the Lady Ghostbusters remake its fair shot, so if I could go into that piece of crap with an open mind, I think I could do it with almost anything. I went into this with the optimistic view of, maybe it isn't as bad as I've heard, and if it is bad, it'll end up being laughable fun like so many of the movies I enjoy. How wrong I was. Whatever investment I have in this story is due to the weird curiosity of seeing if it gets better. It's like when you start watching a bad movie or TV show that goes nowhere, but you develop this strange investment in it and hoping that something will happen and the story won't continue to stagnate. Because of that, I have foolishly decided to pre-order I Saw Number 2. Also, because I need to know what these monkey men did to disrespect Avery, causing this rumble. Yes, Eric July already has my dollar even if it isn't for the reason he intended. And I'll do another video reviewing I Saw Number 2. Just because I didn't like the story doesn't mean I don't hope the best for July and Ripaverse Publishing. I commend him for going out and giving it a try, but sometimes things don't turn out well, even when someone does try their best. This was meant to be a one-time thing that I was going to post to my personal channel. I've never done anything like this before, but I had a fun time and I plan to make some more review videos after I do one for ISOM number 2. So if anybody out there is interested and want to hear more of my idiotic ramblings, like, subscribe, ring the bell, and all my socials are in the description. You know, all the annoying obligatory e-begging stuff. Also, please leave a comment on what I could be doing better, because I'm just now learning how to make videos and I would like feedback on how I could improve. I'll close with this. Don't let anyone spoon feed you bullcrap on what you should think about anything. I'm just some guy behind a mic spitting out his opinion into the endless void of the internet, and you should never fully take anything I say as gospel. I recommend you go out and form your own opinion instead of just following a chosen herd. And with that, I'm Jesszilla, and this has been my moronic opinion. Thank you for your time.